Hello, welcome to the next video. This is antibiotic primer number six, and this is a little look at cefepime, another cephalosporin following on from ceftriaxone in one of my other videos. And this one has the kind of side title of a lateral escalation for reasons which we'll come on to in a second. It gives us a good chance to think a little bit about cephalosporins in a bit more detail and to make one really, really important learning point right at the beginning. But before we do that, just as a quick reminder, the scenario we've been looking at is of a young child, a community associated with pneumonia. They've had a range of different antibiotics come their way. Again, this is a make-believe scenario. Probably by this point, you'll have had microbiology involved a long time ago. But for the sake of argument, this person hasn't got any better. They've had vancomycin, azithromycin, piptaz as the latest antibiotic. You might be considering, if there was still no improvement, a carbapenem. But there is another antibiotic that you might consider before then, and that is cefepime. The really important learning point to be made right at the start is that cefepime is often used in place of PIPTAS and depends on your local hospital and institution where you end up working. And the point I really want to say Wherever you work, wherever you go on to spend your uh, your days as a, as a doctor and as a prescriber, always follow local guidelines. When we're thinking about PIPTAS and we're thinking about cefepime, sometimes they use one in place of the other, depending on local guidelines and resistance rates. And it's the resistance rates which is the key thing. With cefepime, you gain coverage against certain organisms and you lose coverage against certain organisms. <clears throat> And it is important when we're thinking about why cefepime and, and why that particular antibiotic will cover it, as we've done before, by going back to spectrum of activity. What does it work against? Well, it's going to work against many staph. It doesn't work on MRSA, but it retains MSSA coverage. It also retains streptococcus. Cephalosporins are not useful for treating enterococcus infections. They are just not used. Enterococcus has lots of resistance mechanisms which allow it to resist cephalosporin action. And so for patients with infections with enterococcus, you would never pick a cephalosporin. Where cefepime comes into its own a little bit is with the gram negatives. So remember, I said that gram negative coverage kind of gets a bit better the further along the generation you go. This is four out of five generations. And so this one is really good. And it works well on the gram negative rods. It works well on the respiratory gram negatives and it also still works on pseudomonas. Straight away, we're kind of thinking that the spectrum of activity here is sort of similar with PIPTAS. And again, this is where it comes down to local guidelines and what your local hospital is, is using. Some places we use PIPTAS, some places we use cefepime. This is another cell wall active antibiotic, so it won't be useful for atypicals. And another difference where we see a difference with cefepime and PIPTAS is with the anaerobes. So it's useful for oral anaerobes, but it's not useful for GI tract anaerobes. What that means is that if you had someone with an intra-abdominal infection and you were thinking bacteria in that region, what do we need to cover? Well, yes, we've got the enteric gram negatives covered, but we would probably need to be thinking about GI anaerobes. And so we would need to add in another antibiotic. And so that's why you often see cefepime used in combination with metronidazole, because the metronidazole plugs the gap that cefepime misses. Of course, again, in some places, you may use PIPTAS. PIPTAS does cover those GI anaerobes. Again, why, why not just use PIPTAS? It all comes down to resistance. And you will see when you look at resistance rates across the UK, that at a granular level, you see surprising differences between different hospitals and different regions of the country. So always follow what the local guidelines say. Let's go back to our chart and you'll see cefepime makes an appearance at the bottom. And again, very broad spectrum of coverage. You'll see that the gap here for enterococcus is widened. Again, cephalosporin doesn't work. No point prescribing it. You'll also see that for the very first time, the very last gap in our organisms is plugged. And it's very useful at covering an unusual group of organisms, 
which we'll come on to in a second. These are the escapum, escape or space organisms. I'm going to refer to them as space organisms. What are they? This is a collection of different organisms, gram negatives, that have inducible beta lactamase. The beta lactamase, remember, is the enzyme that breaks down the antibiotic and it's inducible. What that means is that it is switched on when those organisms are exposed to the antibiotic. Con in, in contrast, a constitutively expressed gene is one that is switched on or made all of the time. So here, imagine we had an organism, we exposed it to keftriaxone, so a third generation kefalosporin. It initially might look promising because these organisms would actually probably respond but in time, what they start to do is they switch on the expression of a beta lactamase, which breaks down the keftriaxone. So we would actually see that patient stop responding. If you suspected one of these things happening, and by the way, this at this point in the real world, probably they would have been looking for these organisms to, to see what was going on, but they would be identified by culturing. They go by a few different names. Escape and space organisms are the, are the two names which I've seen quite a lot and you may see kind of used more frequently. What does it refer to? S stands for an organism called serratia. This is a gram negative with a very distinctive red pigment. So the moment you plate this out on agar and it starts to grow, you'll see this very, very characteristic bright red colony. Um, so that's the serratia. P stands for a few different organisms, actually. That can include Proteus, an organism called Providencia, and also Pseudomonas. The image I've got here is of Proteus growing on agar, which is containing blood, and you've got the very characteristic ring structure. This indicates swarming, where the bacteria move in waves because they're motile, swarming out in collective motions. Proteus is important in a GI tract organism, but also in a urinary tract organism, one or two other regions as well. A stands for Acinetobacter, a very important hospital infection, important respiratory and also sepsis. C stands for something called Citrobacter, and E stands for something called Enterobacter, not Enterococcus. Enterococcus is a gram positive, thinking back to our chart. Enterobacter is a gram negative. These are all slightly more atypical, unusual organisms, should we say. Um, and you would probably be, in maybe in the back of your mind, if your patient wasn't responding, perhaps you might be kind of considering some of these. But it's an unusual group that contain an inducible beta lactamase. You could, if this was the case, we would probably be thinking cefepine, we would probably be at this point regularly speaking to a microbiologist. But in the back of your mind, you might be thinking about a carbapenem. If we're thinking about the antibiotic ladder, they're the drugs at the very top of the tree. But there are one or two other drugs that we could consider just before we get to that point. We'll consider those in the next video. Thanks very much.